morning, everyone. This is really brilliant. We weren't sure how many people had um, registered for this, so we were pretty overwhelmed with the amount of people who were here. So thank you for joining. Um, so my name is Claire Woodhead. I'm Deputy Business Partner for Medicine, and we've got Ruth Hale Padwin, who's Financial Analyst in, we're both at University Hospitals Morecambe Bay. Ruth has led on this project and I submitted it as an innovation. Uh, Ruth's worked very hard with um, our, all our colleagues in finance and she's collaborated with the other teams within the trust, especially our I3 team, our information technology team, to produce this tool. Um, we're all very proud of her and she's worked very hard and she's going to take you through all the slides now. I'm just here for a bit of support and to nudge her if she forgets to move the slides on. So. <laughs> Do bear with us because this is the first time we've done it. Thanks again, and I'll pass you over to Ruth. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Claire. Um, so if we start with a bit of background about how we were managing our reporting and um, our budget reporting and also our scheme of delegation, which is our authorised signatory lists. So it's the responsibility of our financial management department to maintain lists of budget holders and authorised signatories for budget codes and staff who receive monthly budget reports, which is often a wider group than just the budget holders because other staff within the budget holders team can have authority to spend against the budget. So they need to be aware of the financial position too. So this information we collate is used by other staff, such as the AP team, our accounts payable team, to ensure compliance with the trust FSI's approval levels and so that only approved staff are authorising expenditure from the relevant budget codes. In addition, an accurate list is necessary to ensure that the right staff receive monthly budget reports and their staff in post reports and can only access those reports that are relevant to them. So the problem we had was we had multiple places where we were capturing the data so we had a data set of staff who should be receiving online reports and Excel sheets listing authorised signatories, which not only had to be maintained for changes in staff, such as leavers and new starters and staff changing roles within the trust, but also for changes in approval levels as per our SFIs. Our FSIs aligned staff bandings with approval level. So that meant that when an analyst was asked to set up somebody new, they had to find out what that staff members of pay was and where that aligned with the SFIs so they could know what level of expenditure that member of staff could be responsible for. So you, it's, it was a very cumbersome way of trying to find and maintain the data in different areas and it was quite time consuming for the analysts. So the challenge for us was how I might we develop a paperless and easy to maintain list of authorised approvers and their cost centres. This, ne this information needed to be available to all members of the finance department as a reference guide to ensure queries are directed to the right person the first time and systems are set up to ensure the approvers can access their relevant budget statement. We kind of have a mantra at our trust, one source of the truth, one source of data that generates whatever reporting is needed. So no one is reporting on the same thing, but coming up with different information because they're using different data sources. Once one source of data also ensures you're accessing something that is current and being maintained and isn't something that hasn't been updated for a while. And you haven't realised because you, you know, you're using something different than somebody else is using. So what we did, so the administration of this data lies with our financial anal analysts in financial management departments. So we met and we had discussions around the issues and the more time consuming tasks that it involved. And we all felt that we would prefer to move away from the sort of static nature of an Excel sheet to a database. And we felt it would be more efficient and adaptable to our needs. So none of us are SQL experts, but we do have great expertise within our IT department, our, our trust. So it made sense to approach them and explain our brief and ask for some support. And once we had our IT bod, so to speak, we laid out what we hoped, what we did, what it was we were trying to do, what took us the most time, those um, time consuming areas, and what we hoped could be built into a system. So our IT colleague came up with some ideas and advised what we could do, what we couldn't do, 
but also came up with ideas that we hadn't even considered or wouldn't have even known could be done because you don't know what you don't know and was able to offer us op options such as integration with our ESR, our payroll systems and our email systems. So IT went away and they built us a database and then they gave us it to test out and we tweaked and modified it and met and chatted and how we found it. We fed back, it was tweaked, it was modified. And ultimately we ended up with a sort of a new database system that was bespoke for our needs. So what we have now is we have a data set that fulfills several financial requirements from a single source. The data is live, it's constantly updated every time we're informed of a change, you know, from the care groups to make. And it's used for multiple purposes with and it links everything together between the finance ledger, our ESR staffing system and the trust email uh, server. And the ESR staffing linking to that ESR staffing system was a real highlight for us analysts because it meant the finance database. Could it means because you're linking to other trust systems, it means that information can appear automatically. So such as a person's current work email or their pay scale. So we weren't having to go away and do the manual work on the manual trawl to try and find that information out. It was already feeding through from other trust systems. The system is updated by financial analysts as appropriate. And because the system is essentially a full piece of software, the finance teams can audit compliance. So we can see if budget holders are locking on to review their budgets and we can monitor their awareness of their budget positions. So what we have is we have accessible up to date information that's easy to maintain and use, which optimizes sp staff time. And it's helped the accounts payable team also to process invoices faster because the signatory information is readily available in a report for them to access. We've adopted at the trust currently and we are still adopting or working on faster closing at month end. And this automated process of sending out budget reports has enabled us to meet tighter timeframes. And we're saving staffing time. I keep saying this because it's so important because the less time you're doing manual things, the more time you, as, as, as analysts are analysing rather than just collating information. And it's removed a lot of the need for manual manipulation or manual searching out of data. We've been able to also, which especially during with COVID, following COVID times, and many of us are still working from home, and we've been able to manage the authorised signatory process efficiently while working off sites or we're a multi-site trust anyway, so we can access it securely from any location wherever we may end up hot desking. So this is what the front end of our system looks like. This is what the analysts would access and uh, where they go in and administer. So you can search for a member of staff's name in the search field. You can do it via a surname or the forename. And this system, because it's linked to the ESR, once we find that person, the system automatically then populates all the rest of the information for us. So the email will appear, we'll get a we'll know what pay scale they're on, we'll know where they are contactable, you know, where their where their site is. And that's just such a time saver for us and in the background also because there's some very clever scripting in there some SQL scripting what the system will do is it will take that information about the banding it has loaded in our current SFI limits and it will tell us what the SFI limit is for that individual so all an analyst now has to do is they can select from our current list of active budget codes what budget codes they want to assign to this individual and then all we have to do is and we can also just and we can assign numerous budgets because obviously you can be responsible for more than one budget um, and all we have to do as analysts is identify are they going to be the are they the budget holder are they going to be an authorized signatory and can they access or do they need access to the monthly reports and then this feeds into our reporting list of who gets what and who can sign for what and that's that's our job done at that point. All the data is then in there, ready to come out the other side. 
And because we're using a database, we also were able to get other functions set up, which is really useful to us. We can email our budget report notifications out ourselves once we've completed our month end reporting cycle. We used to have to ask, T, ask IT to sort of handle that side of the comms. And now it's just a push of a button to email our budget holders. We can add whatever narrative we wish to the email that goes out. So, for example, if we have tweaked or added something to the reports that month, and we want to draw the budget holders attentions to it we can give them a description in here or ex an explanation of anything that's changed. This is the notification that goes out to our budget holders. And as you can see, it's great because we can have shortcut links here to the reports themselves. And we can even, add, we've even also got on here training videos about how to view the reports and use the reports, which is great if you've got some new budget holders who aren't that familiar with the process yet. And we can and we can and we also have used the email function that we now have to, you know, to communicate directly with our budget holders to send out staff surveys and get feedback on how we're doing. We load our financial data straight into this database. Again, it's just a push of a button and you have set you know your files that you want to load in go in so that's your staff in post information your ledger extracts and our up-to-date chart of accounts so all our data is going into one place and the data that comes back out is in is in our reports and also not to forget into our scheme of delegation report also known as authorized signatories so this is an example we're using ClickSense as our reporting tool currently and this is an example of the kind of reports that our budget holders will get one of the great things we're able to build out of the um, database is this uh, authorised signatory report. So this is accessible to our AP team and they can um, access this anytime and save it as a favourite on their laptops or their PCs. And this is all the data you saw going the front end coming out of a report. So we have levels of one to five of um, signatures for each budget code. So you can have more than one person able to sign against the budget code, which obviously helps cover leave and things like that. And there's a search field at the top because AP won't be as familiar necessarily with our financial coding structures and our codes as financial management might be who are using them on a daily basis. Um, so there's a search field at the top and AP can search with a person's name or part of a name or a budget code or a budget code description or part of a budget code description and then it will filter and give you know give them a list so I can search for ward and it will give me a list of all the ward budget codes and all the people who can sign against that so it's quick and easy to use and it, most importantly it's up to date so whenever they're accessing this report it is the most current data So that's actually the end of our presentation. Um, this is just a little reference of some of the technologies that have been used to create our database. Um, obviously, much more um, much more technological than you know because we've had the i3 colleague support, so they they are already in our i3 using things like Blue Prism and they use SQL Server databases all the time. So these are some of their applications and. Um, it's just having that collaboration and liaison with them has given us a great tool for us to be able to use within our finance team. And so I don't know if anybody has any questions, but Claire and I are happy to take any questions. Hey, Stephen, you've got a question. Yeah, I'm just wondering, because obviously you're saying about your authorised signatures are within this system, etc. But how did, how did you got around, obviously, getting an actual signature off people? Uh, you know, are you not doing that or not at all? No, we don't. Uh, we don't hold the physical signature now, do we, Ruth? Well, no. And have all it been all right with that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Right, yeah. OK. Because they don't, they don't really you know they don't sign anything in ink anymore anyway so um through the system now yeah uh, we've got a well 
we've got an Excel sheet basically, but we add things in as a link, so we've still got the old sort of signatures as such. Mm -hmm. So in our ledger system, oh. we can add emails as um, sorry in our AP system we can add emails so that if audit wants to look behind an invoice, you can see if that invoice has had to go out to somebody. You can see the email trail and you can see that person returning the email, confirming they're okay with you know that invoice yeah. being paid. So all that kind of audit data can be held electronically in the system actually. Yeah, so I was a little bit late at the beginning. So I don't know if you mentioned, but what actual ledger system are you using? We're currently using Oracle. Okay. With a view to changing, though, quite <laughs> imminently, yeah, imminently, <laughs> just because of a change in the whole sort of structure of the northwest sort of patch area, anyway, and we're all going to sort of be on the same Oracle uh, ledger system going forwards in sort right. of 2023, 20, 20 into, into the future. But this was still for Oracle, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen. And um, Paul, have you got a question? Um, I think you're on mute, Paula, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was just really just sorry to ask what, what the report was, um, what, what you used for ESR. Was it a standard report? Did you say it was a staffing post or did you make your own report? The the ESR data set is, um, so there's two things. We have um, our own staffing posts that we compile within our financial management department. And that is something that we're currently still doing in Excel and then that is what we load into the system to create the staff import reposts that the um, that the budget holders see as part of their reports. But then the ESR, the thing that links into the authorised signatory, that is straight out of an ESR system that IT, you know, can link us into and that's mm -hmm. just feeding in those bits of data about, you know, the staff details around their emails and their their pay grades and stuff. But in terms of the actual staff in posts that we allude to go, load to go into the reports we are compiling those ourselves still in financial management at the moment with again with a view of electronic getting that sequeled up so that it can just be produced yeah. straight from our payroll reports and that's our kind of next job oh fantastic no good presentation thank you very much hi it's paula um hi, yeah. Carl. um i was just wondering how you build um escalation of invoices into your um, authorised signatory database. I know you said you could have multiple people um, under like a cost centre and that, but is it is it to recognise the escalation of invoices if people are away and it goes up the scale or if they're over a certain amount, you have someone sign at that level, but then it needs a secondary signature. I just wondered how you incorporated that. I don't know the answer to that one, do you, Ruth? I don't know for sure because that would need somebody from the AP to say how we very much built it with their kind of idea of what would work for them so I don't know for sure how they do that sort of escalation bit with it but we, but can, we can find we'll out them. yeah it would be really useful questions to know. Thank yeah you. and so that's Paula, you, Paula isn't it yeah Stephen, have you got another question? I, wish you hadn't yeah, I was just going to say, on, I, I don't know if your system works the same as ours because we're on Integra, but um, you know, back to Paula's question, actually, we've got a hierarchy built within the system itself that deals with the invoice approval side. So, um, so the authorised signatures does sort of feed into that, but obviously that, you know, it's the system itself that sorts out you know, yeah, the, we the had that when we were on Integra, but right. now we're on Oracle. We haven't got it anymore. It's not built into Oracle. So oh, that's right. why we've, we've got to do it outside. So I wondered how oh, no. um, it was done here as they as you use Oracle as well. Mm. Oh, nasty. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ruth, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, um, so first ones, I think Paul, yeah, Paul's after pays. So how do you differentiate, differentiate between budget holders and authorised signatories? We've got that. We, yeah, so we've, 
we um so at the end of the day the, the information sh comes to us via the care group or our you know departments out there um and they'll say oh can we have so and so they just started or whatever can they be set up as a and they will let us know whether they want them to be somebody who gets the monthly reports or has access to view the reports they'll i they'll say if they want them to be a signature and then we obviously just have that sort of um, front end screen where we can click whether we want them to get reports or to be a signature or both. And then there's a second part to that question. If this is EFR, how do you account for staff who work via the university on research and our budget holders? I don't think we've got any external. We, don't, we I think we may have one or two contracted types in there, but we can if there is a manual override needed because they're not in our ESR system what we can do well what we do do well I have done is um, just uh, contact our colleague in I3 and they can manually you know put an entry in for that person so that you know because it's not going to come through the ESR system so that for their duration they can also be treated as a member of staff so to speak within you know getting reports or or if it's just to be a signatory or whatever so we can manually add people for those type of reasons oh i didn't know that thank you <laughs> um there is another question in there um what sql knowledge was required within finance for this project or did you solely rely on it for the server and sql at the moment, we solely relied on I3, but the more you see that you can do with SQL, there is a little group of us in finance now, and we've recently been talking with colleagues at Blackpool who have mm. been doing a lot more SQL work within their finance department. We're very keen to kind of start to develop that within our sort of finance staff. Um, so we've sort of been signing up for some courses and things like that because it's something we would like to be able to do more of not taking away from the I3 department, but working with their help, so to, so to speak, but just gives us a bit more autonomy to once we've got maybe packages built up and stuff to be able to then maintain them ourselves, but also tweak them and uh, be a bit less reliant on them. Yeah. So, so once we've got things set up, we can sort of run with them ourselves if we have a bit more SQL knowledge. I think we were quite surprised in what was possible, weren't we? And yeah. that, now we've seen a taster. We've got like, um, yeah, a, we've become more inquisitive and we want to know more for ourselves. Mm, we do. I mean, Blackpool, you know, they're doing all sorts of things like their journal feeds and stuff like that. They're sequeling in, aren't they, rather than sort of, well, sequel compiling their journals, so to speak. And so it's that kind of stuff. Again, Anything that kind of takes away from that manualness of inputting data and freeing up your time to be less just an administrator and more of an analyst is something we're really keen on because we want to spend more time looking at our position, not just getting the information in to see what it looks like. Brilliant. Um, I've got another question that's come in. Um, just wondering how long it took from start to finish. Um, it wasn't that long. I think it was about two months or so. It was, I don't think this was a big ask for our I3 departments. I think, you know, it was fairly, a fairly easy thing for them to pull together. It was more just about, it was probably two months for us to get this up and then maybe another month just having discussions with AP about what would be useful in a report for them and getting that sort of built up for them to use. And can, can, the digital budget system be rolled out to other trusts or will the trust have to like start from scratch and develop their own? I think yeah I, ours is obviously fairly bespoke for us but um, in terms of the process and stuff I mean it would be have a word with your I3 department and as I say we've listened to the kind of technologies used and I don't know if that's stuff that all i3 departments or i sorry we call them i3 because that's mm -hmm. the name of our it department um because they're information informatics and innovation um and i don't know if other trusts are using things like blue prism and stuff it's a fairly newish um sort of 
tool, I think, and robotics and that kind of stuff. So um, it is bespoke to us, but if there were questions people wanted to ask or if they wanted to know what sort of questions to put to their I3 department, we're happy to sort of, you know, compile a wee list of of uh, things that we asked our I3 and things that our I3 think other trusts can do or might be just very bespoke to our trust. Yeah, so the last part to that question was, can we offer support? So I suppose yeah, we, totally. we've got that list of questions that they can ask yeah. me and um, you should all have our email addresses as well. Please ask us questions because um, we've we one thing we do have is a great IT department and they are very innovative. So, you know, we're happy to sort of um, get their take on ideas that or things that they've done to help us that they can share with others. Are there any more questions from anyone? And we'll get back to if we get back to you, Becca, with that quest answer for Paula, would you be able to distribute that? Yeah, of course, no worries. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Thanks. Right, if there's no more questions, thank you so much for joining. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. you all again sometime thank you. soon. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bye. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.